Are we the jerk for going to the dean of our university when our teacher tried to fail us after we outsmarted his test? My humanities classes were taught by three professors, team teaching, lectures, small groups, etc. And that worked out most of the time. However, our final project was a classroom simulated society and they split the classes in half to do this. They told us all that we would need to stay in the rooms in a portable and could not leave. The rules for the project were that the students would split into upper class, middle class, and lower class groups, with each group having an irregular amount of tickets for travel, money, and food and drink. The upper class got 10 tickets for almost every category, the middle class got 5, and the lower class got 2. Each of the three had to decide on how to spin their tickets and could give them away if they chose. The upper class was the only one that had travel tickets and the lower class was the only one that had entertainment tickets, aka TV time. In the first of the two sections of the group project, all the students stayed the whole four hours and the project went about how you would expect it to go, with the upper class ruling the other two and taxing them in tickets. That section of the project was during the school day, between lunch and dinner. Our section was directly following them, so we couldn't go to the dining hall for dinner. We also couldn't bring outside food or drinks. I had to eat on a schedule for medical reasons, but I was told that I would only be allowed to do so if I bought food or drink with our group's tickets. I was put into the upper class, so we had enough tickets for me to be able to do that, but then there were none for others to have anything. We, the five of us in the upper class, ended up splitting a can of pop and a small bag of chips. The people in our section of the project were mostly missionary kids. I'm not though, so we were mostly an idealistic bunch to begin with. All but one of the lower class groups left the building to go eat dinner because they knew they weren't going to get fed otherwise. They weren't allowed back in and got failing grades because they didn't follow the rules for the project. Q, malicious compliance. The rest of us followed the rules to the letter, but did it in our own way within the confines of those rules. The tickets got spread around mostly evenly so everyone could travel, have at least one food or drink for their class to split, and have entertainment tickets. When it got to be three of four hours, our class started singing, show me the way to go home. We then started singing the most annoying songs we could think of for the last hour. We absolutely drove the professor up a wall and they couldn't tell us to leave because they would have not been following the project rules either. We knew we were playing with fire with this one because the project counted for a good chunk of our final grade, but we didn't care after finding out that the professors weren't going to allow any exceptions to the rules, even for medical reasons. After we were done, we went to see if there was any way we could still get dinner. The cafeteria stayed open for us a half hour after it was supposed to close so we could eat. This was a Friday night. Here's the fallout. On Monday afternoon, we all came into the lecture hall buzzing about the two extremes of the project. The people who ran off knew that they were going to fail, but the rest of us in both sections were sure we were going to get passing grades. We were all told that the first section, the one that imploded, would get passing grades and that the second section, the ones that shared more equally, would fail. One of my friends worked at the campus bookstore and knew that each stack of the project ticket slash rule books came with a teacher's manual. Since the professor did this project for all their humanity classes at this level, they didn't get a new teacher's manual each year unless the project changed drastically. So the rest of the teacher's manuals were sitting in the back of the bookstore. Locked up though. The friend told his boss what happened and his boss gave him a teacher's manual. Those of us that completed the failed section of the project had the professor's words on tape because we were allowed to record lectures. We took that and the manual and made an appointment as a group with the dean. The dean thought the professor had been utterly ridiculous and we got passing grades for the project. The professor tried to argue that there was no way that the project could ever have had this outcome, but the dean didn't go along with that. His answer? You teach at a Christian university and expect that your students aren't going to follow their beliefs? The professors had to change the syllabus so that the next year had the simulated society project removed and something else put in its place with better rules. But let us know, were we the jerk? Oh man, I could only imagine a class project like this happening today at the community college I went to. It would have probably been chaos. Group projects in general are always a hassle in my opinion because you always have someone who doesn't pull their weight. I will say my best group project was in high school. I had an English teacher that told us that we needed to be in a group and act out our next project. I couldn't tell you what the project was, but I was with a couple of buddies and we decided to act out a fight scene of some kind. 
I remember wearing a white t-shirt and my friend stabbed me with ketchup for a blood effect. For some reason, our teacher's hot wife was there and we made her bust out laughing. It was a good day and I'm pretty sure we got an A because we made her smile. My clueless coworker almost kills people by not listening to my commands. First things first, this did not happen to me, but a friend of mine who doesn't want to get in trouble. Any names will be changed to protect their identities. Anywho, secondly, the night lead was new, fresh off the training grill and was not used to this aggravating coworker's antics. Loaf was at the grocery store she works at, helping in the freezer section, unloading boxes of frozen food like vegetables, chicken, fish, the like. She is working when her co-worker, let's call her AC for aggravating co-worker, comes over asking to help because as she claimed, she had worked the frozen section before. Loaf, with no reason not to believe her, said that she would be glad for the help. Now, Loaf did know that AC was susceptible to cold, so when she arrived at the frozen section without a jacket or anything, Loaf asked why AC wasn't wearing anything to keep warm. Here's how the conversation went. Loaf was putting down the box she was stacking. Hey AC, don't you get cold easily? Yes. So where's your jacket? Oh, I left it in the break room. But you want to help me in the frozen section? Why didn't you grab your jacket? Oh, I just didn't feel like it. Loaf looks at AC. You didn't feel like it? But this is the frozen section and you're susceptible to cold. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Go get your jacket. AC huffed angrily, fine, whatever, is what she said as she sauntered off to get her jacket. After she leaves, Loaf continues working, stacking things where they go. A few minutes later, AC returns, thankfully wearing a jacket. AC walks to the first box she sees and opens it, revealing a very specific, very obvious brand of fish, labeled the same yellow as the section of the fish wall, which is where all the fish are supposed to go. AC looks at the package, then looks at the section next to her, frozen meals. Definitely not where raw fish is supposed to go, and then she continues looking for where she puts the fish in that section, ignoring the fish wall completely. At first, Loaf let it slide, assuming she would realize that it was not where fish go. Loaf looks over a few minutes later, and AC is still looking for the fish among the frozen meals. Loaf walks up to her and says, AC, the fish goes over there on the fish wall pointing to the very easily spotted wall of fish at the end of the wall behind her, next to the deli. AC nods and proceeds to walk over to the fish wall, but takes about 20 to 30 minutes to find where the exact brand of fish goes within the fish wall. She finally emerges to put the fish away, coming back to get another box. This time, it's a box of pre-made frozen meals. AC proceeds to take them all the way to the fish wall. Despite taking a long time to look for fish in the frozen meal section, which was right behind her. Loaf looks at AC strangely before once again helping her find the right section because I'm sure you readers have noticed everything is divided by sections. So she finishes putting up that box and then picks up another one. Still frozen meals, but a different brand of frozen meals. And once more goes to the fish section. Despite having just been shown where the frozen meals go, Loaf once again gets up and directs her to the frozen meal section only for AC to pick up another box still of frozen meals and head directly for the fish wall. This happened not once, not twice, but several times. The naive creature that is Loaf blew off AC's lack of awareness of the frozen section because it had been a while since AC had worked in that section. Loaf assumed that with enough help, AC would finally remember her way around. She did not. With each time Loaf had to help AC find the right section, she became more and more frustrated until she huffed a little bit louder than she should have. She walked away to prevent herself from doing anything drastic, such as braining AC with a bag of shrimp. She ended up finishing up her own section and going to the restroom for a bit. When Loaf returned, AC was on the floor, sobbing her heart out and complaining to the night lead that Loaf had been bullying her and screaming at her. Now, there were several co-workers who were around and had seen everything that had happened. When questioned by the lead, the co-workers all corroborated that everything AC was saying was untrue and that she had thrown familiar fits in the past. AC was promptly taken off the frozen section and another co-worker was called to help Loaf. It wasn't until later that everyone finally learned why AC, having worked in the frozen section before, was unable to find where anything went within their sections. She had left her magnifying glass at home which she needs to be able to see clearly, despite already wearing glasses with inch-thick lenses. Everything else was just plain ignorance. But let me know, 
was my friend the jerk? Hold up. You are telling me that there's legit people in this world with inch thick glasses and they still need a magnifying glass to see things? That's wild. But that also makes it understandable why she was making so many mistakes. But I feel for the OP's friend here because I've definitely worked the frozen section before and the last thing you want is to deal with somebody who's making your job harder. It's too cold for nonsense. Am I the jerk for speaking up to my bosses when I find out that I haven't been getting properly paid for our shared waiter tips? Normally I'd say hell yes, but this one's tricky. My check was short about 80 to $100. Actual amount unknown, but that's a good estimate. My manager forgot to put me in the tip pool one night. I was a patio server, it was frigid, nobody sat out there and I got cut. So I didn't have a cash out. They probably brain farted and forgot I worked a few hours. But here's why I'm wondering if I should just let it go. It's the best job I've ever had, by massive margins. I'm a dinosaur in this industry, so I know. It's the best management I've ever worked for, besides this incident, of course. I get anything I want. Set schedule, done. Best shifts, done. I'm not treated fairly, I'm actually the favorite. I'm the only one with full-time hours, and I make bank. I easily out-earn my coworkers by margins. I get these perks, I suspect, because I shut up, show up, and do my job and don't cause problems. I used to be the squeaky wheel, always complaining about something. I think I'm now reaping the benefits of learning from that mistake. I know it's money I've earned, and I should speak up, but I also know it's going to cause these managers that I like to have to call corporate and make a thing of it. And honestly, I don't need the money. Like I said, I'm well taken care of. In fact, this check is what I expected with that shift. So would you speak up? It's the first time anything like this has happened to me. They're organized and professional, and that's why I'm kind of laughing about it. Should I just let it go and continue enjoying my amazing job, or rock the boat for money I technically don't need? Am I the jerk for this? I do need to point out that this story is actually three separate posts and that was the end of the first one. An update to my last post about not being put into the tip pool for a shift. After reading the advice, I decided to casually bring it up with my manager. I figured I'd say, no problem, I don't need the money, please don't bother with it. But now, I'm freaking livid. I said, hey, I noticed I wasn't put in the tip pool for this day. Does that mean it won't be on my check? And she was like, well, sometimes if people don't take tables and depending on how much work they actually did, we may just enter them in as a trainee so you'll get paid that rate instead of the tip pool. To which I said, oh yeah, I've never heard of that. Nobody ever told me that. So sometimes we might come to work and depending on the section we're given, we may get cut and lose half of our hours. But in addition to that, we might also not be paid at the exact rate we're expected. So now it's a double whammy. How is it fair that I got dressed to come to work like everyone else, but because the section you decided to put me in had a lack of business, I'm being paid less than a third of what my normal rate is. And further, if that's actually the case, has there been a time that you paid other servers like that and I was the beneficiary? because no other server here has ever mentioned being left out of the tip pool. And there were nights like this that they didn't have any tables either. But I had to share my tips with them. I went on to say because, oh boy, I had a lot to say. I just failed to see how it's fair that someone might have to come to work at a much lower pay rate without even being told in advance. Don't you think it's a simple courtesy at minimum to tell someone if they're drastically changing their pay rate? And now that I'm learning this, I don't trust that there's any transparency in the tip pool situation if you're just randomly deciding if someone worked hard enough to be in the tip pool. Wouldn't you be a little upset if your check was light and your boss was like, oh, hey, uh, we paid you less that day. Don't you think people have the right to know what their pay rate is? And now that I'm learning all of this, how and when can I see this tip pool books from the past few months that I've been working here? Because I no longer trust that it's being done fairly and it's my legal right to see it every night. Anyways, that's all I had to say and she just stood there wide-eyed as I kept going. Finally, she said, I'll check with the other managers to see what he did. To which I replied, please do, and I'd like to see those tip books tomorrow. I was calm, my tone was professional, but I was still shook. That wasn't the response I was hoping for. So much for my job that I was bragging about in my last post. Turns out these jerks are shady too. Moral of the story, I'm glad I spoke up. It wasn't an oversight or a brain fart. And even if you think you like your job and trust your managers, always get your money. This was the final update to this story. 
So I was able to access my pay stub this morning and did some math to figure out how and if I was paid for that half shift. Turns out I was paid the tipped minimum wage only, with no tips. So even despite the convo with the manager yesterday, they may sometimes intentionally take someone out of the tip pool and pay them minimum wage for that shift. That wasn't done either. I'm either owed tips or owed a makeup from the company for not meeting minimum wage that day. Our state laws are per shift, not per pay period, thank God. So now that I know this was an oversight, they definitely wouldn't expose themselves legally like this, I'm actually surprised our payroll company didn't automatically notice this. I can speak to the other manager tonight about getting that money, and I'm definitely getting it now. My post about letting it go was so naive. I'm also going to have a hard talk with him about her response, that sometimes if people don't take tables and depending on how hard they work, we will take them out of the tip pool and just pay them as a trainee instead, I'm going to go to bat for all the employees on this topic. It's just so wrong. Here's what I intend to say. Let me know if there's anything I should add. I'll tell him it's not fair if they do that because it's not the employee's fault that they were assigned a slow section. They did what they were supposed to do. They got dressed, commuted, did side work, and performed as part of the team as expected. It's a pooled house, and the point of a pooled house is specifically so a server doesn't get screwed just because their section sucked. And if I wanted to take my chances on getting cut off at patio shift and walking home with minimum wage, then I also want to reap the benefits of crushing it in a busy section like I usually do. And I want to walk home with $700 tips I earned in that busy section instead of $300 I usually walk home with. Because again, that's how a pooled house functions. I can go elsewhere to a not pulled house if I wanted that. Furthermore, this notion that you'll judge someone's performance and if they worked hard enough to be in the pool is BS. Everyone who works here works hard. I'd be just as upset if I learned another coworker wasn't in the pool just because their section sucked. Nobody deserves to come to work and be paid one third their wage unexpectedly. $14.25 an hour, our state's minimum, is still at least $4 less than our lowest paid employee in the building. And even he gets an additional $3 to $4 per hour because of our kitchen appreciation fee. So if our lowest paid employee is making $21 to $22 an hour and he's 16 and sits on his phone all night, he's our porter and we do love him, how the freak can you responsibly justify paying anyone $14.25 an hour? You know we're all adults and have bills, right? I can't afford to work for $14.25 an hour, and if that's even a possibility, then consider this our final convo and I'll walk out the door. Wish me luck, maybe they'll surprise me and tell me they found an oversight and they are paying me the tips I'm owed. I won't settle for a makeup to minimum wage now, in light of this new development. I want to keep the tips I worked for and deserve. But let me know, what would you do in this situation? Man, this was kind of funny to read at the start. Opie was bragging that he had an awesome job and came to find out his job is just as shady as everyone else's. I don't really have much to say about this story other than you always need to collect the money that you're owed. A stupid policy at work causes me to do some malicious compliance. So quick background, I'm from the UK. I have worked in the US since 2001. I work for a smallish company, I was around the 100th employee, that was growing steadily. This story concerns personal time. There's five days a year that you accrue that could be used for when you're ill or need extra days of vacation. You could only accrue up to 120 hours max, three weeks. I hit my maximum after three years and I rarely used it, just left it topped up. My thought was that my parents were getting older in the UK so I could use the time in case there was an emergency. So I kept my bank full for that purpose. Side note, you stop accruing hours when you hit 120. And you don't get those hours back, so I gave up some days to keep the available topped up. Sometime around year five, I did take a personal day. A couple of weeks later, I noticed that in a paycheck that my personal time had not changed. It was still 112 hours. It should go up about an hour and a half per two weeks of working. Waited until the following paycheck and still 112 hours. I call HR to ask. It appears at some point the previous year, they changed the policy to max out at 80 hours. Anyone with more would not lose it, but would not start occurring until they were below the new maximum level. Obviously, I wasn't happy with this, so cue malicious compliance. Immediately, I take five personal days off, which got me to about 72 hours. From this point on, every time I was about to max out my personal time, every five weeks or so, I would schedule a day off, 
or use up multiple days over Christmas to extend my vacation visiting family. I would game the system between what vacation I could carry over versus personal time. They never gained an extra hour out of me in personal time again. Then in 2011, we were bought out by a larger company. In April of 2012, my wife and I had this huge vacation planned, a 16 day African safari gifted by our tour operator my wife worked for for her 10 year anniversary. This was planned at least 12 months ahead of time as I needed to plan out my vacation time. Up until this point, we were allocated all of our vacation for the following year on April 1st. Around mid-December, the new company HR brought us in for a meeting. They were announcing that they were making changes to the vacation and personal time to bring us in line with theirs. As of April 1st, all vacation time is now accrued. You can borrow up to five days in advance with prior approval. Also, as of this date, personal time is no longer personal time. It's sick time. You need to be sick to take it or use it for doctor's appointments. On the plus side, they are increasing it to seven days per year. Though not much use to me, I haven't taken a sick day off in 15 years. You will need a doctor's note for three days or longer of illness. I pointed out to them, unlike the company that bought us, we actually had a production facility that manufactures actual products at the rate of over 1 million per day. The reason we had personal time and not sick time was from experience. They weren't interested. This is the policy. We know what works for you better than you do. At the end, they asked for any questions or clarifications. I raised my hand and asked, I have a vacation that's already approved and I've been planning it for over a year and it starts in April because that's when we would get our full allocation. But it's longer than the five days I can now borrow. And you have also limited the use of personal time. What do I do? I was expecting them to say, come and see us. We'll work something out. What I actually got from these fools was literally a shrug of their shoulders with the face that said, tough crap. So I said, screw them. As my wife worked for the tour operator, and as there still was some space available, they helped us move up the vacation to March. I calculated my personal time to max it out just as we were traveling. I blew all 10 days of personal time on the last two weeks of March, zeroing it out just before the policy change came into effect, and borrowed a couple of days of vacation from the following year to complete the end of the trip. After the change in policy, the production facility ended up with machinery being shut down multiple shifts per week. We had 10 pieces of equipment that took two to four people each to run them. As operators or helpers were sick, then some of the machines had to be shut down. One person being out of the team would lead to a couple of other personnel having nothing productive to do on the shift, which ultimately increased costs and customer lead times. It's easy to schedule around a personal day that was booked in advance, but if you run a lean shift to maximize profits, it's impossible to schedule around someone calling in sick. Rather than amend their policy and admitting that they didn't know best, they hired a couple of extra people each shift to cover the sickness policy. Official staff around the company would be mysteriously ill every two months or so for a day or two at a time. Most weren't even subtle about it and are always sick on Fridays and Mondays. I left around four years ago. The policy stood and staff milked it for all it was worth. The resentment of the policy change ran deep. You reap what you sow, I guess, but let me know. Am I the jerk? Policy changes that mess with your vacation days is always the worst at big companies. My old job when I first started had it to where if you never use vacation days throughout the year, they would pay out those days at the end of the year. So a lot of people who weren't the vacation or days off type of workers usually love the end of year paychecks. Well, about a year or two after I started, they switched to a new system and were no longer going to pay out vacation. You either used it or lost it. Now this was an issue because a lot of those no day off guys were also lifers. So they had the most vacation time built up. Now that they had to use it, it started to cause a lot of problems in the schedule. Some people had weeks off at a time or just started bunching up a bunch of three to four day weekends most of the year. Don't even get me started on around the holidays. But that just goes to show you, if you change something that works just fine, the workers are gonna find a way to make you pay for it. That's it for today's video. If you want to make sure you don't miss out on any content, hit that subscribe button and make sure you hit that bell to turn on notifications. If you want to finish listening to all those stories, use the playlist at the top of the description. And if you're someone who live streams and needs copyright free music, check out the Cream of the Crop music by searching Cream of the Stream on Spotify or whatever music platform you choose. Remember, it's free.